The Vape Passion Show, episode 39. Hey, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. This is episode 39. I'm recording this on October 23rd. So to start out like usual, I have a beer and I'm gonna pair it with knee juice. So this time I have the Lucky You IPA. This is from Breckenridge Brewery. And IPAs, they tend to, they tend to pair well with things like lemon, coconut, uh, macaroons, breads, creams, things like that. So I'm gonna pair it this week with Pound It. This is from Bonsai Vapors. So this is a lemon pound cake. So it should go well. I would assume it's going to go pretty well with this beer. So let's give it a shot. Mm. Yeah, pretty good. All right, so let's just get into it. Um, so uh, I got some new e in for review. This is, uh, I was contacted by High Class Vape Company, and they asked me if I'd like to d- review three of their flavors from their budget line. Um, there are pros and cons to reviewing budget e-juice. The drawback is that the price of budget e-juice doesn't really compensate for the amount of time that goes into recording and editing the videos. Um, the three bottles that they sent me would have costed $12 total, so not a whole lot. Uh, it's probably equivalent to me getting paid about $5 an hour to review their e-juice and promote their brand. But on the positive side, I, I get to discover a new brand and I get new content for my channel and I get to tell people about good good budget e-juices. And that last one is the, the mo- one of the most important reasons to me because a lot of people can't afford to vape premium e-juices all the time. So, I mean, I sure can't. So I like being able to tell people about good affordable e-juices. Anyway, I picked out Island Dream, and that is a vanilla bean ice cream, pineapple and coconut, golden cream pear, which is pear with caramel whipped cream and green apple glaze, and cuckoo puffs which is malted milk, hot cocoa, chocolate cocoa, and vanilla custard. Uh, I haven't tried any of these flavors yet, but they sure sound good and they they smell good too. I've actually been seeing high-class vape company all over the place in the last couple of weeks, so they must be doing a big marketing push or something. Uh, They have pretty good prices on the budget line. A 15 mil costs $4 and a 120 mil bottle costs $20. Like I said, I haven't tried any of them yet, so I'm not giving any recommendations right now, but just letting you know in case you wanna check them out before I do my reviews. And then also, uh, this past week, I decided to try and hand wrap my own Clapton coils. This is my second attempt at Clapton coils. The first time I used a drill, and it was a disaster. Um, I didn't even get one coil out of it. The the coil just wrapping kept wrapping around itself. So I just I had a terrible time. That was a few months ago, and I just didn't want to try it again. This time, I decided to really take it slow and do it entirely by hand, straightening the wire and everything. Uh, It took me about an hour to get about a foot of 24 gauge canthal wire wrapped with 30 gauge canthal wire. And my hands were killing me by the time it was done. I doubt I'll ever do it again by hand. But I'm really glad that I did it because it helped me understand the whole process. Uh, I could see the hand and finger positions that I needed to use to wrap correctly and how to position the wire. And I think that will really help me next time I try to do it with a drill. All right, uh, and then I received a few comments on my channel that I wanted to to talk about. So uh, from George, he mentioned that, uh, well, in my last episode, I was talking about how there isn't a whole lot of great products on the market right now, but I'm looking for uh, recommendations and mods are something that I I need mostly right now. I I love atomizers, but I don't have a whole lot of mods. So I'm looking for recommendations on mods. And George, he mentioned that I should try the Kanger Dripbox 160. And um, I've actually been looking at that for a while. Uh, he, he mentioned that he loves his and it's only, and under $60, it's hard to beat that price. The RDA, he mentions that the RDA that comes with it is actually pretty good despite what several reviewers have said. And I found that too with a lot of devices that I, I'm not that particular, I don't think about atomizers and mods and things. I, I, I usually seem to like everything I do find some cons with them, uh, just like anyone else would, but you know, not everything can be perfect and we all have our different ways of vaping, but I would imagine that I'd probably like the Dripbox 160. The only thing is that, and like I asked George in my response to him, was if it had a, a delay when firing, because when I reviewed the K-Box 200, it had a two second delay and it drove me nuts. I, I just I couldn't stand it. So I asked him about that and he said that there's no delay whatsoever. The biggest drawback that he found was that 
the battery life isn't as good as some of his other dual 18650 mods. So, um, oh, and he also mentioned that he doesn't like that you can't adjust wattage in temp mode. And uh, for me, that's not a problem because I don't vape in temp mode. Um, I just like va vaping in wattage mode most of the time. But uh, yeah, I, that's probably one I'm going to get. Uh, I'm hoping to find some sales on it for Black Friday. And then I also started getting some comments on my One Hit Wonder Ejuice review video. Uh, I reviewed the full line on that video and um, I don't know, maybe that video is starting to show up in related searches or something. So I, I got a few comments on it in the past week. One of them from Nikki. And she says that she loved that I paired each e-juice with a beer. She's new to vaping and she, uh, she says she's also a beer snob. So seeing a review from a, a fellow beer lover is fantastic, she says. She would have never thought to pair her e-juice flavors with beers and she loves the idea. So she's going to be trying that. And uh, I got another comment similar to that one from What's a Name on YouTube. He says, brilliant idea reviewing with beers. He's trying to quit cigarettes, but he finds it hard not to smoke when he drinks. So he thinks that pairing with beers is going to help him. So he's, uh, he ordered, um, I, th I think he ordered Muffin Man and Milk Man. So I uh, wish him the, the best of luck with those beer pairings. And I also got a comment on that video from someone who ordered and says that it's that one hit wonders line is very sweet and overpowering for him and now he has 100 mils that he can't vape and that's the problem with one hit wonder and that's why i didn't order large bottles i only ordered their sample sizes when they had them on sale for uh, i think it was black friday last year or maybe the year before but i just couldn't i didn't want to throw the money down even though their e-juice is really affordable i didn't want to throw that money down to have uh, 100 milliliters of e-juice that i didn't like so yeah, that's one of the big drawbacks of buying from a company like that who sells only in very large sizes. Personally, I, I do like the One Hit Wonder line, it, and it is really sweet, but I do like really sweet flavors. So something to keep in mind if you are looking for, uh, if you are interested in One Hit Wonder. It might be too sweet for some people, and it's definitely a coil killer. Like, um, you know, one vape session with a One Hit Wonder e-juice, and you're going to have to change your coils or, or clean them off because it gets really gunked up. And then I had a comment on my Vapor Boost Sweet Dreams review. Uh, a few comments, actually. Um, people are asking me how they can find it because the site's down. And, yep, they went out of business. So, unfortunately, you can't get it anymore. Uh, and that really sucks because I, I really liked that Sweet Dreams e-juice. It was a, it's a melatonin e-juice and it's supposed to, it has like Earl Grey teas and other things like that. It's supposed to help you sleep at night. Zero nicotine. And um, there are other brands out there who sell e-juices like that. I haven't tried any of them, so I can't give any recommendations on that. All right, and now let's talk about some advocacy regulations, long government type stuff. So thehill.com, they just published an article saying that the White House is reviewing a rule from the FDA that was originally proposed back in September of 2015. And it was sent to the White House on Monday of last week. This rule states that the FDA can regulate tobacco products as a drug, device, or a combination product if it's used to diagnose or treat a disease. This rule also gives the FDA the authority to regulate a tobacco product as a drug if it has nicotine that affects the body differently than a combustible cigarette. Uh, that would include electronic cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. So what does this mean? Well, according to vapes.com, retailers would be required to undergo a clinical trial process for all products. I'm not entirely sure if I understand how this is news because the PMTA process already requires submission of non-clinical and clinical studies relevant to your PMTA. And if those studies don't exist, you need to conduct and submit your own research. Uh, and those studies don't exist right now. So as far as I know, everyone does have to submit their own research. The one thing that I'm thinking, though, is that if the FDA is able to get vape products classified as a drug, this might mean that even if someone does a study for the PMTA, it can't be used by other manufacturers. Uh, every manufacturer might need to do their own clinical trials for every one of their products now uh, if this passes. I'm, I'm kind of just thinking out loud here. I don't know how true this might be, but if that is true, that would really put an end to the vaping industry, I think. Uh, nobody could afford a clinical trial for every product they sell. And a lot of these small businesses, they can't afford one clinical trial for one product. It's just too expensive. Something else that vapes.com stated in their article was that if e-cigs are classified as a drug, that would mean that the average consumer would need a doctor's prescription to get them. Uh, that's another scary thought. I have no idea when the OMB will make a decision on this ruling, 
but this seems like a pretty big deal. I worry what might happen to the vape industry if this is approved by the White House. All right, uh, let's move into some, some uh, product related stuff. So uh, nothing big really. I haven't seen any big releases of anything. A lot of people are talking about the, the Dude RDA. That looks really cool. I haven't really looked much into it. I'll, I'll probably take a look here soon. But uh, the one thing I wanted to mention was that Vape Wild, they are doing uh, fall flavors. And uh, I always love Vape Wild's fall flavors. Fall and winter, they're my favorite seasons for e-juice because when, when, it's when everyone releases their holiday flavors. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Ho Vape Wild's holiday releases. And they just sent out an email announcing the reintroduction of previously released flavors. And that includes Half Baked, which is a fresh honey bun flavor, Glazed and Confused, which is Fluffernutter, uh, Peanut Butter, Marshmallow, and Glaze, Mr. T, which is a chai tea flavor, Schmitten, which is buttery mint, Frosty Sprinkles, which is deep chocolate mocha and peppermint, and The Splurge, which is a Cajun bread pudding, custard base, and cinnamon and nuts. I haven't tried any of these flavors before, but Vape Wild stuff is usually pretty good. They aren't a premium brand, but they do make good budget e-juices, and they're also running a special for Halloween. So if you order anything between October 22nd to October 31st, you'll get a bonus in your shipment. Uh, the bonus is a surprise. It could be anything from a vape band to a mod, according to their website. So yeah, if you guys plan to order from Vape Wild, consider buying from my link. I get a commission, which helps me keep the show going. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. It's an affiliate link. You can go to vapepassion.com slash vapewild, and it will re redirect you to their website. Uh, then go to their sample section and look for their fall sample pack. If you guys do buy from my link, I, I really appreciate that. All right, now let's talk about some science and research. So Brent Stafford of Regulator Watch, he interviewed Dr. Michael Siegel. Uh, he posted the videos last week. And Dr. Michael Siegel, he is a professor of Boston University School of Health. He's also an expert in the tobacco control movement. He's been involved in that movement for a long time. And uh, different from other people in the anti in the tobacco control movement, he is a vocal supporter of e-cigs. So what was interesting from the interview that I, I learned is that he actually did his training under Stanton Glantz in the 90s. Uh, Glantz was his mentor, and he viewed him as a hero of his and admired his work in the tobacco control movement. The difference between Glantz and Dr. Siegel is that Glantz is vehemently against e-cigs, and Dr. Siegel is pro-vaping. So a uh, pretty stark difference there. Uh, in Stanton Glantz interview with Brent Stafford, Glantz said that people shouldn't be using e-cigs when they are, there are proven products on the market that work to help smokers quit, such as Champix and nicotine gum. Dr. Michael Siegel, he responded to this by saying that the majority of people who use electronic cigarettes are using them because the other products on the market didn't work for them. Uh, if it was as easy as using a nicotine patch or nicotine gum, everyone would use them, obviously. So. If these products work, there wouldn't be a need for electronic cigarettes. Uh, these products have about a 10% success rate. That's the problem. For those 10% of people, it's great and that, that it's working. But to tell the other 90% of people who, that they don't have any other option but to continue using the products that don't work for them, that's just unacceptable. And uh, also in the previous interview, Stanton Glantz, he stated that the number of kids using electronic cigarettes has been increasing much faster than the smoking rate has been declining. Uh, the only change that occurred is that most of the kids who are cigarette smokers now are also dual users with electronic cigarettes. Brent Stafford also pointed out that Glantz data came from a report from agencies like the CDC and Mon Monitoring the Future. Glantz said that it's validated and unbiased research, so he got Dr. Siegel's uh, comment to that one. And uh, Dr. Siegel, he responded to this by saying that the CDC has been completely misrepresenting the data, specifically that the CDC has classified electronic cigarettes as a tobacco product. Um, there's never been a study that has shown that youth using electronic cigarettes have moved to tobacco cigarettes. Um, E-cig experimentation has skyrocketed, but the use of tobacco has plummeted. And But by adding electronic cigarettes into the tobacco category, Glantz and the CDC are able to claim that tobacco use has remained the same. Dr. Siegel, he also mentions that the CDC has an inherent bias towards electronic cigarettes. They just can't seem to get past the idea that something that looks like a cigarette, used like a cigarette, and involves the inhalation of nicotine is a good thing. Uh, 
he, he says that you could have hundreds of studies proving that electronic cigarettes are beneficial and the CDC wouldn't embrace them due to their ideology. And then they talked a little bit about dual use fallacy. Um, so Dr. Siegel, he mentions that there are two fallacies. First, people who try the nicotine patch, the majority of them, 90%, don't become dual users. They become sole users of cigarettes because the patch didn't work. Um, so you have to know what you're comparing it to. And um, this is what uh, anti-vaping groups are not doing. Um, there's also a myth that it's all or nothing. Uh, that's simply not true, according to Dr. Siegel. He says that there's a health benefit to smoke fewer cigarettes per day. Dual use, it, it won't help with heart disease, but it will decrease cancer risk and lung disease. Uh, dual use also lowers addictiveness. The less you smoke, the less addicted you become, making it easier to quit later. And there are studies that show that this is true. He says that dual use is not a complete solution, but you're on the right path. People should not be discouraged from dual use. And then they talked about the FDA regulations. So uh, Dr. Siegel, he says that the FDA regulations are counterproductive and harmful. They give cigarettes special protection. No cigarette brand has to show the FDA anything. Cigarette companies don't have to show how safe their products are, but every e-cigarette on the market does. So all vape products have to go through an expensive and burdensome process when it should be the other way around. Uh, given everything that we know about tobacco, burdens and hurdles should, should be given to the cigarette companies, not vape companies. The FDA regulations also could have sped up the process of getting vape products approved to be on the market, but instead they're trying to kill uh, what Dr. Siegel says, a public health miracle. And uh, I'm sure any, everyone listening to this would agree with that too. So he says that people will likely never stop using nicotine products, but the way to end this epidemic is by eliminating combustible tobacco. Uh, there will still be nicotine use, but in a much safer form. And then they talked about misrepresentations of science. So he says that there's plenty of data available right now that supports the idea of using electronic cigarettes as an alternative to combustible tobacco. While we're waiting for the FDA to finally decide that there's enough data, millions of people are dying. Uh, it's not okay that the government is telling smokers that they need to wait until more definitive data comes out. So Dr. Siegel says that there are four things that the data we have now absolutely and definitively concludes. Number one, that electronic cigarettes are orders of magnitude safer than cigarettes. Number two, that switching to e-cigarettes is going to greatly improve a smoker's health. Number three, that for many people, electronic cigarettes are helping them to quit, and that in fact, they have been able to quit using e-cigarettes when they were unsuccessful with other methods of quitting. And number four, there's enough data to show that this so-called problem of youth using e-cigarettes as a gateway to smoking is a non-existent phenomenon. It's just not happening. And then they also discussed in this interview um, Stanton Glantz's comment about the 95% safer statistic from the Public Health England statement. Uh, and that's funny because that's actually something that um, I talked about in my show last week. It just, it was a such an, an odd thing to for Glantz to argue with. But anyway, Dr. Siegel says that it's not a made-up number but it was an attempt to define the most conservative benefit that electronic cigarettes offer. Um, he believes that the 95% number is a conservative estimate and that vaping is actually much safer than that. 95% uh, is still thousands of deaths per year and Dr. Siegel, he just doesn't see that with vape products. There's no evidence that these products will cause chronic lung disease, cancer, or even that someone can use electronic cigarettes long enough to ever see any negative health risks. And he also talked again about the anti-tobacco movement, how they're misrepresenting science due to their ideology uh, about electronic cigarettes, how they look like smoking and that vapors are still getting nicotine, like I mentioned previously. He also mentioned that he believes one of the biggest frustrations that anti-vaping groups have is that vapors know that vaping is not causing harm to them, which bothers those anti-vaping groups because they don't believe that people should be bene benefiting from nicotine. It's just something they can't get over in their minds due to their associations of nicotine and combustible cigarettes for all these years. And another thing they talked about was that vaping opponents are saying that electronic cigarettes are hindering smoking cessation efforts, efforts and that people who vape are less likely to quit. But these people are really distorting the science. They're looking at studies of people who use electronic cigarettes and comparing them to people who don't, then estimating what the quit rates will be. But the people who are using, using electronic cigarettes are not going to quit with other methods which is why they are using electronic cigarettes. They can't quit without holding something in their hand. They know that they need something that simulates the psychological and social aspects of smoking. Gum, lozenges, patches, are they're just not going to cut it. 
And so vaping opponents are twisting the science by claiming that these people are less likely to quit, when in fact, these are people who would have never quit smoking with any other method. They would still be smokers. And that's why electronic cigarettes are a life-saving product. So yeah, it was a, it was a really good interview. Um, lots of really good stuff in there from Dr. Siegel and pointing out pretty much how all of these anti-vaping groups, they're, they're just twisting the data to, to fit the, their ideology. All right, now I want to talk about uh, an interview with Battery Mooch. This was on ST Vape's channel. So back in episode 34 of this show, I covered a bunch of battery safety tips from Dean the Vaping Biker's interview with Battery Mooch. Uh, so last week, ST Vapes had Mooch on his show for another interview, and it was it was a lot of the same thing. So I'm not going to cover everything that I mentioned before. You can just go back to listen to go back and listen to that episode if you want. But there were some great things that Mooch talked about in ST's interview that he didn't mention before. So I'm going to talk about those. So first, where to buy batteries? So Mooch says that uh, he recommends imrbatteries.com. Alum.com, and that's spelled I L L U M N.com, and LiIonWholesale.com, so that's L I I O N Wholesale.com. And uh, he says that LiIonWholesale.com has a great reputation. They give a damn and they try to get the fakes out of their inventory. Um, if you're in Europe, he recommends NCON.NL, that's N K O N.NL. And uh, he says that there are other generally safe sites, but not as good as the ones that. That I just mentioned, and that would be rtdvapor.com, uh, D as in dog, and vapenw.com. And uh, he he mentions of those those top three that I mentioned earlier. Um, he says that that doesn't mean you won't ever get a fake from any of those guys because fakes are everywhere. Uh, even the top battery guys are fooled sometimes. Uh, but trusters trusted vendors will do the right thing and let customers know and replace fakes if they are discovered. So you just won't get that kind of service from buying from places like eBay. So that's why you really should buy from reputable vendors when it comes to batteries. Another one they talked about, a subject they talked about was uh, parallel battery amp limits are actually not doubled. Um, if you're running two 20 amp batteries in parallel, you're not getting 40 amps. Um, that's what you would see if you if you did it out on paper or using you know a battery calculator or something like that. But it doesn't actually work out that way. So Mooch likes to take 15% off the max limit to stay safe. Uh, so for example, two 20 amp batteries would be about 34 amps. Drop that down to 30, and you're in the safety margin. Uh, it's not 50 50 for each battery because it's dependent on the quality of solder, the quality of the contacts and the connections, the wire length on the battery sleds and so on. So um, yeah, it differs from every mod. Uh, one battery might get more than the other due to things like that. Um, and like I said, on paper, two 20 amp batteries equal 40 amps. But in the real world, when you put those batteries in a sled, there's gonna be a misbalance. If one is hotter than the other, you need to pull the power down or bring the resistance up. And then uh, they talked about what are the best 26650 batteries. He says there aren't many good 26650s on the market, but the best so far are those iJoy batteries. They aren't made by iJoy because iJoy doesn't make batteries, but we don't know where they come from. Uh, they appear to be a great 30 amp cell. That's that's really all we know about them. And then they talked about dented batteries. So he, uh, Mooch, he says that nobody has ever actually tested small dents in batteries. Um, he says it's so placement specific and battery specific that it's difficult to say whether or not a battery dent will be a problem because batteries are all manufactured differently. Uh, a dent at the bottom is worse because all the layers of the battery are rolled up at, and they're at the bottom. That's where all the ends are exposed. So if you dent the bottom, some of those ends could roll over on top of each other and short circuit. At the top, the co top contact could dent in and touch the venting disc, which would turn the battery into a pipe bomb, according to Mooch, because it can't vent anymore. Uh, those are the most problematic areas of a, of a dented battery. A dent in the side, such as uh, a 1 8 inch dent, probably isn't something to worry about, but anything bigger than that, and you should put the battery outside for the night and then recycle it the next day. If a dent is, is going to be a problem, you'll usually know right away, either because it will go into thermal runaway, or it will discharge very quickly. If it dis discharges very quickly, you can measure the voltage quickly. Um, you can put the battery somewhere non-flammable for the night, and then the next day check the voltage again. If it has dropped a lot, get rid of that battery because it has a slow internal short circuit. Uh, if the battery isn't warm at all, and all signs point to the battery being okay, it probably is. 
but there aren't any tests to quantify whether a dent will be a problem or not, so use a dented battery at your own risk. If you're worried, just recycle it and get a new one. You know, batteries aren't that expensive. All right, now let's talk about some uh, DIY e-juice stuff. Um, Charlie Noble, they published a post on their blog titled The Not-So-Discontinued Series, PB Serial. So this is some really cool news for DIYers, I think. Uh, Charlie Noble, they published this recipe for their old e-juice called PB Serial. It's a peanut butter cereal e-juice. Um, so when the deeming regulations hit on August 8th, they decided to move all of their flavors to 60 ml bottles to prevent having to submit a PMTA for every bottle size that they made. During that process, they also cut some flavors from their lineup and PB cereal was one of them. So rather than let that flavor disappear forever, they released the recipe for everyone to make. So I'm gonna talk real quickly about what that is, what those ingredients are. Uh, TPAs, peanut butter at 8.5%. Capella's sugar cookie at 5.5%. Capella's Vanilla Custard V2 at 3.5%, TPA Malted Milk at 1.5%, FW uh, Flavor West Bavarian Cream at 0.5%, uh, Flavor West Cotton Candy or Ethyl Maltol at 0.5%, and Saline Solution, one drop per 10 mils, and Acetyl Pyrazine, one drop per 10 mils. So, I highly recommend reading the blog post on their site about this recipe because they talk about each flavor concentrate and how and why it works to complete the final mix. For example, I'm not an ex expert mixer, so I've never heard of using a saline solution or, or salt in an e-juice. If you read the blog post, you'll see why they use salt, and that's because peanut butter is usually salty. Um, he says that you can get a sterile saline solution at a drugstore, or you can make your own with some distilled water. He didn't really talk about uh, how to make your own, so I looked it up. And I found a post on e-cigarette forum saying to boil 233.88 milliliters of distilled water and then stir in 2.12 grams of salt, uh, non-iodized salt, to make a 0.9% solution. Uh, you, you, will, you will need a digital scale to make that accurately. Uh, personally, I think you'd be better off buying a sterile solution, uh, much less hassle, and then you know it's made correctly. Um, while I was doing some research for that saline solution stuff, I also found a lot of people saying that um, saline solution, it doesn't actually add salt to the, a salty flavor to an e-juice. It's more um, placebo effect, uh, and a lot of people are saying that. So I don't know if you even need to add saline solution to this. But yeah, if you want to make it the way they make it, um, then pick up some saline solution. I'm probably going to try this recipe out, but... I'm, I'm just gonna skip this alien solution, I think. All right, and then one last topic. Uh, I just thought this was interesting. I saw a thread on e-cigarette forum talking about uh, making their own e-juice at their local vape shop's DIY e-juice bar. Uh, I've never heard or seen of a DIY e-juice bar before. That, that concept is really interesting. Uh, in this person's case, he said that you pay $10.50 and you can mix up your own 50 ml bottle of e-juice from dozens of available flavors. So that's a really cool idea. Um, I, and I wonder if this is a, a legitimate way to get around the FDA's requirements of getting PMTA approval for e-juice products. It lets customers make any e-juice they want at the VGPG ratios they want and with as much nicotine as they want. So um, it's not pre-made, so it sounds like it would be able to skip that PMTA process. Um, I don't know. But the person who, who wrote the original post mentioned that his mixture ended up tasting like feet after he took it home to try it out and uh, he makes two flavors that actually sounded really good. So I think it goes to show that you should really have some idea of the flavors you're mixing before you just throw things together. Um, it would be cool if the, that vape shop had printed recipes that customers could follow. The vape shop name was never mentioned, so I don't have any idea where it is, who it is, but that's okay because I don't want to get them in any sort of trouble if what they're doing isn't acceptable. Um, I don't even know if what they're doing is a bad thing, but I would feel bad for getting them in trouble for something that I think should be allowed. Anyway, I really want to find a vape shop that has a DIY e-juice bar. So if, if you guys know of a shop anywhere in or around the Denver metro area uh, of Colorado that has a DIY e-juice bar, send me an email. I'd really like to go try it out. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 39. Uh, if you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page at 
patreon.com slash vape passion. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at vape passion. I'm also on Facebook. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me, giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe if you aren't already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of the show either on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. Uh, if you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or uh, when I put up a new episode of this show, um, sign up to my weekly newsletter. You can find that on my website. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me anytime, uh, alex at vapepassion.com. All right, well, time to finish this beer and go mow the lawn. I'll see you next week.